My name is Ada Szczepaniec. I'm an assistant professor and extension entomologist at South Dakota State University. This short presentation highlights key characteristics of corn rootworm biology, presents a general description of BT technology, gives a simple overview of resistance development, and I emphasize here the importance of managing insect resistance and adopting integrated pest management, IPM. IPM is a sustainable, and more importantly, it is a long-term approach to managing insect pests. Finally, we will talk briefly about some specific management recommendations for corn rootworms. I should mention that there are a few points that I talk about here that are more specific to South Dakota or north central region of the U.S. And this presentation also focuses on western and northern corn rootworms, which are the major rootworm species here. But majority of this information is generally applicable to any region growing corn and using Bt corn hybrids. Let's start by talking about biology of corn rootworms first, because being familiar with basic pest biology, and this applies to all pests, is essential to understanding the best methods to manage them. You basically have to know your enemy very well in order to select the best strategies to fight it. Corn rootworms are beetles, and while adults can damage the plants as well, it is the larval stage that is the most devastating to corn. Corn rootworms, like all beetles, go through complete metamorphosis when they develop, which means the immature stages do not resemble the adults. One of the most important characteristics of corn rootworm biology um, in terms of their management is the fact that their life cycle is very closely tied to corn. Western and northern corn rootworms also have only one generation a year. Adults of these beetles will emerge over an extended period of time from mid to late summer. This can take several weeks, and adults mate and lay eggs during that time. The eggs are laid in cornfields and overwinter in the soil. And we know that winter temperatures and snowfall affect their survival. Winter temperatures um, affect percent of eggs hatching in the spring, and historically extreme winters greatly reduced western corn rootworm populations in Minnesota and South Dakota. Northern corn rootworms are a little bit more tolerant to cold temperatures than western corn rootworms. The amount of snowfall also affects survival of the eggs. Heavy snow cover keeps the soil warm and moderates extreme temperature changes. Soil moisture during egg laying in the summer also plays a role. In dry conditions, when soils tend to crack, the eggs might be laid deeper and thus be less susceptible to extreme low winter temperatures. Larvae will hatch the following spring and begin to feed on corn roots before pupating in the soil and, and emerging as adults. This is what the larvae look like. They are quite small and slender and can be tough to see in the soil after digging the roots out. The key element of their biology is the fact that they need to find corn roots shortly after they hatch and they cannot survive long or travel far to find corn roots. So lack of corn roots basically means death to corn or larvae. Once they begin consuming the roots, the larvae weaken the corn root system and the common symptom of their damage is goosenecking, as seen in the picture on the left. Corn roots that are weakened like this are prone to lodging after high wind storms. Lodging of corn may not always happen in fields infested with corn rootworms, however. Especially if high wind storms, thunderstorms are rare, the corn often does not lodge. That doesn't mean that these fields won't suffer yield losses, because damaged roots are not supplying corn with nutrients, these, this injury affects the yield. Conversely, if heavy thunderstorms are frequent, they can cause plants to lodge in absence of corn rootworms. So in some cases, digging the roots out, inspecting the root system, and searching for larvae in the soil is really the only way to confirm their presence in the field. If growing conditions are good, corn rootworm damage may not be as obvious. The picture on the right here depicts the damage that larvae of corn rootworms inflict on corn roots. Let's move on to the adults. This is what the adults look, look like. This is northern corn rootworm on the top, which used to be the predominant species of corn rootworms in this area. Uh, and this is the western corn rootworm on the bottom. This is fast becoming the major species of corn rootworm here. And this is also the species with populations confirmed to be resistant to Bt corn hybrids expressing protein CRY3BB1 in several different regions in the north central US. 
Let's move on to Bt and Bt corn hybrids. Before the onset of Bt corn, corn rootworms were managed mostly through crop rotation and insecticides, and Bt technology has definitely changed the way corn is grown. Let's talk very briefly about what is Bt, what is Bt corn, and what are some of the benefits and pitfalls of using this technology. Bt stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a Latin name of a naturally occurring species of soil bacteria. These bacteria produce proteins that are toxic to insects, and there are different kinds of proteins produced by these bacteria, and some of them will have cry in their names because of their crystal-like structure. These proteins are ingested by the insects with plant tissue, bind to insect guts, and interfere with digestion of plant tissues. What is Bt corn? Well, Bt corn is corn that has been genetically modified to produce these cry or other Bt derived proteins that are toxic to insects. Different Bt corn hybrids will have these insecticidal proteins present in different parts of plants and will be toxic to different insects depending on the particular protein type. For example, Bt corn with traits for corn rootworms express these cry proteins in the roots. These Bt hybrids are sometimes referred to as single or stacked trait hybrids, depending on how many Bt proteins are present in these hybrids. Let's move on to some of the benefits and pitfalls of Bt corn. And I should mention that these are not exhaustive, and I only highlight a few important points as they apply to insect management and insect resistance management. One of the most important benefits of this technology is the fact that the toxins are present in select plant parts based on which pest is targeted. They are also present inside the plants, so only the insects consuming the plants are exposed to these toxins. Now this point is somewhat of a generalization because we know that certain Bt hybrids express the cry and other proteins in some unintended parts of the plants, such as pollen, and this is a very complicated issue that is beyond the scope of this presentation. The major point is that Bt present in select tissues and inside the plant has in general low non-target effects than synthetic insecticides applied as sprays. An introduction of Bt corn hybrids has definitely decreased the use of synthetic insecticides to manage these insects. What are some of the pitfalls? Well, toxins are present continually, and in case of Bt hybrids expressing proteins toxic to corn rootworms, they are also present in very low doses. This drawback, combined with the fact that corn rootworm larvae do not move large distances, increases their rate of resistance development. Another pitfall is the fact that there are very few toxins that are available in Bt corn hybrids and there is a general lack of diversity in mode of action of these cry and other Bt derived proteins and this also speeds up development of resistance. And this point brings us straight to the issue of resistance which we're going to discuss next. We're going to talk very brief briefly about what is resistance, how it develops, and what we can do to manage it. What is resistance? When a particular toxin or a synthetic chemical no longer kills the target pest and offspring of the insect and their offsprings, offspring and so on are also no longer susceptible, we call them resistant. This point of offspring's offspring also no longer being susceptible to the toxin is very important because this trait has to be passed on through generations. It has to be a heritable trait. So how does this happen? And before I go into the details, I'd like to mention that I'm presenting here a gross oversimplification of this process, just to illustrate the point. So let's suppose that there are several toxins or chemicals that are targeting the same insect body part. Let's say for this example, antennae. Without antennae, the insects cannot find food, they cannot find mates, and everybody who is exposed and susceptible to these toxins dies. This is the outcome of this situation with all of the individuals that are encountered the poison are susceptible. It's complete annihilation. 
The good thing, however, will not last forever. Nothing ever does. And while many of these susceptible individuals will die for sometimes a very long time, eventually a rare individual that just by chance has a super strong antennae will survive. These super antennae insects will be rare at first, but because they have an obvious advantage over the susceptible insects, well, they're alive, so they will mate and reproduce, and the selection for the super antennae trait is high, the resistant insects will quickly become very abundant. Here's the outcome of that scenario. With the rampant resistance development, most of the individuals are no longer susceptible to the toxin. This situation will take, take place very rapidly if insects are exposed to low doses of these to toxins, as corn worms are in case of Bt corn, and if they are exposed to the same kinds of or similar toxins. These conditions increase selection pressure for individuals that have resistant traits, in this case the superantennae. So a lot of what integrated pest management and insect resistance management advocates are Practices that slow this process down. In case of Bt and corn rootworms, it is planting non-Bt refuges. Including non-Bt refuges increases the probability that the insects that develop resistance still mate with individuals that have not been exposed to the toxin and are still susceptible. This delays development of resistance. In reality, of course, CRY and other Bt-derived toxins and insecticides target insect nervous system receptors, interfere with their digestion, or disrupt their development. But antennulous insects are just easier to imagine, that's why I chose that example. So far we've covered biology of rootworms and talked how closely their development is tied to corn. We've discussed Bt technology a bit and how and why resistance develop. Now we're going to move on to strategies that we can use to slow down development of resistance, and some specific recommendations for managing these insects. Let's talk about insect resistance management, IRM, and integrated pest management, IPM. They are really all about one thing, slowing down development of insect resistance to chemical control and sustainable and long-term strategies for management of insect pests. One of the key points in insect resistance management is using insecticides or Bt toxins that have alternate target sites. We call it mode of action. This slows down development of resistance because if, for example, we alternate between chemicals that target antennae and chemicals that target the wings, the selection pressure for individuals resistant to either chemical is lower. They don't encounter the same toxin constantly. Again, I'm simplifying this by using the antennae and the wing examples just to illustrate the point. Another important component of insect resistance management in case of Bt corn is using proper refuges. This is an important point because refuges ensure that there are enough individuals who are not exposed to toxins and are not resistant and it increases the chance of resistant individuals mating with susceptible individuals. If, on the other hand, the resistant individuals are mating more amongst themselves, resistance develops faster. Adhering to specific refuge recommendations for each Bt hybrid is crucial. These strategies for insect resistance management are really not separate from a proper integrated pest management program. Good IPM program for corn rootworm will include crop rotation, again eliminating the host plant of this insect, corn, will dramatically decrease their populations because they can't survive without corn roots. Proper management of volunteer corn is important too because even if you've rotated to another crop, because a lot of beetles will survive in fields with a lot of volunteer corn, you will still have populations of corn rootworms. Another strategy is proper management of weeds in the vicinity of the fields in general because these beetles have several grassy weeds that they can survive on too. Scouting for beetles to assess if there is a corn rootworm problem in the first place is another important strategy of good IPM. Adhering to thresholds before applying pesticides and using insecticides that have different modes of action. Let's talk about specific management recommendations for corn rootworm management. We'll talk a bit about what is thought to be a high-risk field for unexpected corn rootworm damage, what are the best and second best management strategies. What is a high-risk field? 
If you have grown continuous corn for at least three years, if you've used the same BT hybrid and especially single trait hybrids expressing CRY 3BB1, if you have seen some damage in your fields indicative of cornworm presence such as goosenecking or lodging, and finally if you have seen unusually high numbers of adult beetles, you are likely in the high risk category for rootworm, rootworm infestations. What is the best management strategy? Well, hands down, the best thing to do is to rotate to another crop. As we've talked at the beginning of this, of this presentation, corn worms depend on corn roots for survival. They cannot travel far and they cannot survive long without roots. So eliminating their hosts will eliminate corn worms. A single year of crop rotation to a crop other than corn will decrease their populations. But obviously the more diverse rotation, the better. There are variants of the western corn worms that will lay eggs in soybean fields and their larvae may damage first year corn the following year. And this is definitely possible, but we don't have a clear handle on the distribution of these variants and crop rotation will manage the majority of rootworms. If crop rotation is not feasible, what is the second best management strategy? Well, BT hybrid rotation is the second best thing to do to manage these insects. Alternating BT hybrids will inject some diversity of the toxins that these insects are exposed to and using stacked or primitive traits is advised over single traits. Scientists and extension faculty from Iowa State University are recommending this five-year rotation that maximizes the number of years that corn is grown. This rotation plan includes rotating to soybeans in year one, again eliminating corn for just one year will do wonders in terms of diminishing corn worm populations, going to non-BT corn in year two, including non-BT corn with insecticides applied at planting in year three, but only if there are adult beetles present in the field during year two, and then going to BT hybrids in year four and five with different and ideally stacked traits used in both years. This sums up the basic introduction to, to corn worm biology, BT technology, overview of resistance development, and importance of insect resistance management, as well as using integrated approaches to managing these insects. I wanted to emphasize again how closely corn worm biology is tied to corn and how easy it is to decrease their numbers by simply rotating to another crop for a year. Thanks for watching and if you have any comments or questions, you can find my contact information on the Plant Science Department website at South Dakota State University.